Isn't God's grace amazing? Come on, Mark chapter 9, verse number 14. Happy Father's Day. Um, and I also want to send my condolences to those of you who have lost a father. I know this could be a tough day. How many of you have lost a father? Okay, you're not alone. You're not alone. And, uh, you know, never give a day your joy. We don't serve the day. We serve the Lord of the day. And so let this day remind you of the God you serve, not the sorrow you have. Amen? Mark chapter 9. Verse number 14, I have several scriptures to read, so would you bear with me? And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then the one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And he answered him and said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? And how long shall I bear with you? Bring to me. Then they brought him to to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has it been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he was thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw the people come running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and he came out. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind come out, but by Nothing but by prayer and fasting. Today, I want to talk to you from the subject, I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to do. Has anybody ever been there? Let's pray. God, in the name of Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit just rest upon this house today. Open the hearts of your sons and daughters. Like only you can do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated today. Um, there was a short portion um, where I was a single father of a newborn baby. So even on Father's Day, it makes me want to go back to acknowledge all the mothers of the house. I don't know if you know this, but babies are nocturnal, like little raccoons. They stay up at night and they cry. They're hungry at night. And so I... I uh, talked to my mother to get some coaching on how to, how to raise up a, a newborn baby because I particularly like to sleep at night. Um, I go to sleep early. Any early sleepers in the house? Amen. And so my mom told me, you got to make sure he's clean. You got to make sure he's burped. If, if, if he's got the teeth coming in, you got to make sure he has medicine. You got to soothe him. You got to hold him. You got to care for him. And so... There was one night I went through my checklist. He's crying. I got to feed him. Got to do all the checklists. And I did all the checklists, and the baby kept crying. So I called my mom, and I said, Mom, this baby won't be quiet. NyQuil, illegal. Melatonin, child, not. It's legal. It's cool. (laughs) NyQuil, once again, is illegal. CPS, right away. Baby melatonin. I didn't know that then, though, so... No, for the melatonin, not the NyQuil. Come on, people. So my mom told me, she said, just put the baby down. You've done all you can do. You don't know what else to do. Just put the baby down, shut the door, go catch a nap. I don't know if that's a good parenting device. It was great for me. We'll see in 10 years how my son's doing, but it was 
great for me but because I knew there's a point that we all have a breaking point and you can only do so much. Perhaps that's more for your teenage child when you try to send them to church or man camp to fix them or you try to uh, send them to homeschool or you try to get them in karate or some kind of thing to get their minds activated to get them back on the right path. And after you try every formula you can try and you figure, figure out that you have a hard time fixing your teenager, at some point you come to the conclusion, I don't know what else to do. There's doctors who have degrees who will look at sicknesses in people's bodies. They'll try and practice medicine on you and come to the conclusion, I don't know what else to do. Perhaps that's you today, that you're in a season or a situation in your life where you've tried, you've come up with the formulas of how it's supposed to happen, the formulas of what's supposed to happen, but you don't know what else to do. This is the story of the book of Mark chapter 9 where the religious people are coming together and they're discussing something and they're having an argument and they're arguing, why can't we get the devil out of that guy's son? They're like, get the disciples. Maybe the disciples have the correct formula to get the devil out of that kid, that father's son. And when the father tried everything he could do, the Bible says Jesus showed up and that the people were amazed. And when you don't know what to do, this is not that deep, but it is very deep. He brings him to Jesus. I want you to know today that when you don't know what to do or what else to do, you can bring it to Jesus. Take your burdens to Jesus. Take your cares to Jesus. The Bible said, from the ends of the earth I call to you, I call as my heart grows faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. The reason we're overwhelmed is because we're the highest point of our life and we are the greatest counselor of our own wisdom. But I want to tell you there is a higher standard, a higher principle. His name is Jesus and he's strong when you're weak and he's stronger when you think you're strong. He is the rock of our salvation. And we can come and cast our cares upon him because Peter said it this way, because he cares for us. The reason we don't take things to Jesus and we don't cast our cares on Jesus is because we're still making up formulas. But when our formulas don't work, the reason we don't cast our cares on Jesus is because we don't realize how much he cares for us. I met a man just yesterday, and he went through a, a, a divorce about three years ago. And he was sitting with his, his new girlfriend, and he stepped away for a few moments to talk to me about the hurt that he had experienced from his divorce. And then he wanted counsel from me. He's like, what do I do? My girlfriend wants me to marry her. How long have you guys been together? Three years. Like, well, you should marry her. Three years is a long time. The old saying, fish are cut bait. It's an old saying, so we can, re we can reinvent it. Let's make it new again. Do it or don't do it. And she, and he says, I'm not, I'm not, go she just doesn't get it. I keep telling her, I'm not going to marry you. And she keeps trying to force us, like, we need to get married. And I said, listen for a second. Do you know the last stage of divorce is parallel living? Which means you learn to live at a distance with your first wife. And then she betrayed you. And then you became wounded. And then you built these walls to protect your wounds. And you got in another relationship. You didn't come out of a divorce. You started a new relationship in a divorce because you're living at the same distance with another person. And eventually that person is going to leave you too. 
And you're going to say, what is her problem? This is, the why, this is why I don't love people. This is why I don't let people love me. And you're going to prophesy to your future and keep reliving a cycle because you are a prison, a prisoner to your own wounds. And the thing that you thought kept you safe is actually tormenting your future. And so he prophesies to his future and he can predict his relationships for the rest of his life. Because what kept him safe in one season is actually going to kill possibilities in the next season. This father had a tormented son, so he, he learned to react to the torment of his situation. But he didn't know how to act outside of that season. What it took you to survive in one season will not help you thrive in the next season. What it took to keep you safe in one season is what's going to hinder and kill your relationships and possibilities in the next season because you're not willing to risk it. But let me tell you, you are worth it because the Bible says you can cast your cares on him because he cares for you. He cares that you were wounded. He cares that you were hurt. He cares that you went through what you went through and you can cast your cares on him because he cares for you. As they are sitting there and the father comes, he says, the Bible says he, he cried and he cried out. And how do we fix this? Everybody wants to fix a problem. I hate when people state the obvious. They're like, you're gaining weight. It's like, yeah, I know. How are we going to fix that? How are we going to fix that? Everyone's a prophet now. Everybody knows how to prophesy a problem all of a sudden. Anybody got a solution in this house? That doesn't cost me $9.99 a month. He says, how do I fix the, your disciples couldn't get him out? The religious people couldn't get him out. I can't fix my son. And I'm waiting for Jesus to all of a sudden address the issue with my son. But you know what Jesus does? He doesn't address the son or the demon. He says, you faithless generation. So many people are worried on how to get a devil out. But they don't know how to get faith in. He said, this kind doesn't come out but by prayer and fasting. And we're like, okay, so if you have like a king devil, then you need to fast and pray a lot more. Because that devil is like a bigger devil, so you got to do seven days of fasting that time. But that one's like a, a supreme superior devil, so you got to fast for two weeks. No, this kind, what kind? The kind of unbelief doesn't come out but by intimate relationship through prayer and fasting. Because God is not so worried about what, what he needs to get out of you as much as what he needs to get in you. Because you want to be delivered from addiction, but even though you're delivered from addiction, are you healed from the wound that caused the addiction? Because the Bible says if the strong man leaves the house and he goes through the desert, he'll come back seven times stronger because the enemy lives in our wounds. If you don't want to be influenced by the enemy, then you have to close the door of your wound and let God heal some things in your life. We keep calling things spirits. There is a spiritual reality, but he plays off a natural world. There's not a spirit of Jezebel. There's a woman named Jezebel who had a wound with her father and a spirit influenced the wound to influence everybody else and to shut the mouth of the prophetic. What happens when our wounds are influenced by the enemy? He says, you faithless generation. This is the issue. A faithless father will always produce a tormented generation. The Bible says that in 2 Timothy 1.5, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which lived in your grandmother Lois, 
and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now that it lives in you also. You mean from your grandmother to your mother to you, faith lives? If faith is so contagious, if faith is in the DNA of a generation, I wonder if unbelief is also in the DNA of a generation. And we keep looking at another generation and saying, we don't know what their problem is. We don't, what, I don't know how to fix them. They pick their own pronouns. They do all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, I don't know what, what's wrong with this generation. This generation's just crazy. Let me tell you what's wrong with this generation. Because the generation before has been robbed of faith and quit believing and trusting in God in ways that you are called to trust God. It's when the heart of the father is turned and he begins to cry out for the next generation. That God will raise up a generation of faith. That your grandmother and your mother and I am persuaded that in you also that faith will live and be transmitted in your life. What happens? We want to fix everybody else. God's like, we're not going to talk about his devil. We're going to talk about your faithlessness. You want to talk about the fruit of what you're seeing. But let's talk about the condition of your heart. You want to change everything around you. But what if I could change everything inside of you that would impact the way you see everything around you? And so you would start believing in areas that you are wounded. You would start believing through the eyes of faith and not through the eyes of offense. You would quit being a prisoner of your own wounds and you would start trusting God in areas of your life. You know what the father said? The father said, I believe. Some of you are saying that right now. What are you talking about? I believe. I go to church on Sunday. But then he had to get honest. He said, but help my unbelief. I don't know if there's anyone here that can say, I do believe until she gets on my nerves. I do believe until the bills come in. I do believe until I'm diagnosed with cancer. I do believe until the belief is challenged and then my faith is too weak to believe. So I believe at one level, but help my belief at another level to trust you in ways that I don't trust you, to believe in ways that I don't believe. Help my unbelief. I don't have all the answers. I don't know, have all the mystery of life figured out, but I know I have some doubts in areas of, of my life, but God, as a father, I cry out for the next generation. Help my unbelief. What happens if it switched from fix my wife to fix my faith? Fix my kids to fix my faith. Fix my church to fix my faith. Fix my finance to fix my faith. What happens when we say, God, everything else is not the issue. The issue is an issue of faith. The issue becomes not fix this, but fix my faith. Help my unbelief. I believe at a level of my will, my posture is to say, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Just because you repeat it over and over doesn't give you more faith. I believe, I believe. This is what we think about faith. Hey, hey, just have faith today. And you're like, sure. I believe, I believe, I believe. That's willpower. But when you go to sleep and you quit saying, I believe, I believe, I believe, you still got to deal with you. But what happens if I believe, I believe, but help my unbelief? All of a sudden, faith becomes a gift. This boy it has a spirit, so he is mute and cannot hear. The moment you cease to hear the affirmation and validation of the Father is the area that you become trapped in your life. And so what happens is you're 30, 40, 50 years old, but you're trapped in an eight-year-old moment. Because the moment you quit receiving validation and affection is the moment you've sealed your stunted growth. And so what happens is all of a sudden, you told yourself a lie. You said, I could do this alone. 
Jesus himself got the affirmation of his father. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That was before Jesus did one miracle. That was before Jesus did any ministry. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But before he heard it from the father, he came under the ministry of John the Baptist. Because some of you say, I just need God to affirm me. I just need God to validate me. I don't need anyone else. Jesus modeled that humans need humans. And just because humans haven't met your needs and you've cut them off and said, I can live without it, what you've done is stunt it yourself Woo. Come on. to receive the affection that God actually wants to give you. So I'll tell you how preachers do it. You say, Pastor, that was a great message. And you know what I'm going to do? To God be the glory. <laughs> That's cute. But you know why we say that? is because we don't know how to receive affection. We don't know how to receive a compliment. We know how to receive the identity of sinner because we all know the Romans one. We're just the sinner saved by grace. All have sinned when we make a mistake. Come on, I bet everybody has a tattoo right now. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Have you ever read verse 24? Who are justified by his righteousness. So you take, you, you receive, I'm a sinner, but can you receive you're a saint? You received, I'm bad, but can you receive your good when God made you? He said, this is a good thing. You received failure, but have you received freedom? You received what you've done wrong, but can God tell you today, I'm proud the way you went through that season. I'm proud that you made it through. I know you cussed somebody out. That wasn't that good. But I'm proud that you showed up today and kept serving me even though you had a human moment. Come on. Can you receive God saying, you know what? You had some real fleshly moments, but I'm proud that you kept lifting your hands and say, I trusted God. I'm proud that you kept trying. I'm proud that you kept trying to love her. I'm proud that you did the best you could with what you had. We don't want to hear that from God. I'm just a sinner Say no, I'm a saint who happens to sin. I'm not a, my identity is in the sainthood. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm not getting holy. I'm a holy nation. The affirmation of the Father frees us that we can receive affection. We can receive validation. We can receive love. Now, all of a sudden, you become a better father. Because if you know how to be intimate with the Father, you'll know how to be intimate with your children. If you know how to be intimate with the Father, you'll know how to be intimate with your spouse. If you know how to be intimate with the Father, you'll know how to be intimate with yourself. You'll realize all of a sudden, I am safe in the hands of my Father. Even if my mother and father, this is scripture right here, even if my mother and father reject me, the Lord receives me. So when humans fail you, and they will, you have a safety net. Even if my mother and father reject me, I'm coming, hey, Father, I love you. Even if they don't say the right thing, well, at least Jesus got me in this moment. Even if you've been through a divorce and they betrayed you, uh, get married again. Be, be whole, be well, move on, let's go. No human relationship is going to define the validation that the Father has given you. And when you receive the true validation of God, the true affirmation of God, you can stay vulnerable with other people. You could stay close with other people because they didn't give it to you and they can't take it away. The joy that God gave, they didn't give it to you. Their validation is not your salvation. They're not the, the cake. They're just a little sprinkle on the cake. They didn't save you. They'll never save you. You have a savior. But to hear your wife say, ooh, you look good. Ooh, I love you, baby. Well, cry, cry in front of me if you want. Come here, put your, put your head on my shoulder. Some of you guys are like, what is happening? Come on. All of a sudden, shift <laughs> begins to happen. I'll close with this. And for those of you that like, what are the points? I'm type A, I need points. 
Number one was bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. Number two is believe Jesus can do it. And number three is be lifted by Jesus. Mark 9, 26 says this. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, came out of him, and he, he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. He's delivered, but he looks dead. I want to tell you this today. You've been through the storm, and this is a specific word for somebody. The storm is over now. The storm is over now. We see a little extra gray hair on you because of the storm. We see more wisdom on you. We see that you're a little tired right now, but you're not dead. You're delivered. You might look a little dead right now, but you're delivered. And the storm is over. It took a toll on you, but the storm is over over. I declare over your life today. I declare over your divorce. I declare over that death. I declare over that addiction. That storm is over. It almost killed you. It made you look dead, but you're delivered. You're not dead. You're delivered. You're not dead. You're delivered. You're not dead. I like this part. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. Woo. For th some of you that feel dead today, some of you that feel dead today, I just want the Spirit of God to take you by the hand and encourage you today and lift you up. Say, hey, you're not dead. You're not dead. Come on, if you're sitting by your spouse, I want you to just pick them up. You're not dead. You're not dead. You're not dead. Stand up. You're not dead. Come on, get up. You look dead, but you ain't dead. Stand up. Jesus took him by the hand and he lifted him up. I think Jesus wants to lift up a, another generation and say, hey, you know, it's been prophesied over you that you're dead. It's been prophesied over you. This generation's lost. They're not interested in church. They're not interested in God. But the hand of God is saying, no, they look dead, but they're delivered. And we're going we're gonna to be a generation of faith that raises them up and calls them to purpose and destiny. Lift up. 34 young men went to the camp, and that was a generation saying, we're going to lift up the next generation. We're going to lift up a fatherless generation. We're going to lift up young men who's been raised by single mothers. Thank you, single mothers. But you have men in this house that's going to help mentor those young men. Lift them up. And he asked his disciples, why couldn't we do this? This kind came out nothing but by prayer and fasting, nothing but an intimate relationship with Jesus has the power to give us the faith we need for the future he's preferred for us. Psalm 1835, you have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand upholds me and your gentleness makes me great. With every eye closed, Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive the affirmation of heaven and we agree with heaven today. Well done, good and faithful child. Well done, good and faithful child. Well done. And even if your work hasn't been well done, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus was a substitute. And he did it well. So when you believe in Jesus, you're saying, I didn't get it right all the time, but I'm, I'm, I'm living in the credit of Jesus. I'm not living in the debt of my sin. I'm living in the credit of Jesus. Well done, Jesus. So when Jesus lifts his hand, he's, lift, he's lifting your hand for you. Your discouraged head that weighs down, when he lifts his head up, he's lifting his head up, your head up. Because as he is, so are you. How is he? He's victorious. He's the prince of peace. He's the author of joy. As he is today, so are you. Oh, I feel defeated. No, but as he is, so are you. I feel left behind. I feel betrayed and abandoned. Yeah, Jesus did too, but as he is, so is you. And he overcame betrayal, death, hell, and the grave. As he is, so are you. With every eye closed, if today is the first time or the first time in a long time since you received Jesus or or heard the validation of the Father. I just want to say a quick prayer over you, but I want to know who I'm praying with. Can you just wave your hand at me real quick? Wave your hand at me real quick. I want to pray with you. God bless 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 you. 
when you raise your hand, the Bible says this, I would that men everywhere would lift up their hands, holy hands, without wrath and doubting. The two things that come against men are anger and unbelief, partly because of the validation and the affection thing. And when the Bible says, lift up your hands, holy hands, without wrath and doubting, it's saying the way I'm going to overcome anger and unbelief is I'm just going to give it to Jesus. I'm going to bring it to Jesus, and I'm going to let God validate and speak over who I am. I want you to repeat this prayer after me, everybody. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. You are my Father. I receive you today as my Father. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, my life is never the same. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.